Hi, uh, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Dole Smith. Welcome to my video blog. This is the second edition or second installment. Certainly not the second time I've stuck my face in front of a camera to speak on a topic, uh, but in terms of at least recently trying to do a little bit more in the audio-visual space and not just the audio-only podcast space, uh, I wanted to share with you some thoughts on the gamification of training and exercise. So if you've been in the phone and the app world, which I'm sure you are, they say that um, if, if high school students are an expert in one thing by the time they graduate, it's their phone. Um, you, you just notice how many things are gamified. You get coins or points or, or something that, that um, seems to give the impression that you're winning or that you're getting better, uh, which I think that's a big thing is, is this impression that we're getting better at whatever we're doing. Uh, so anyways... Sam Portland, I did a podcast with him, uh, episode 141. Sam is a brilliant coach from the UK. He also does a lot of like global dynamics and sport of rugby, things like that, outside the box thinker. And he does something called Speedgate Golf, uh, which I heard of from Kirwan and Flap. So that which is essentially the gamification of speed training, the gamification of doing 10-yard sprints rather than going maximal the whole time. So let's say I'm going to do five 10-yard sprints in a workout. Rather than trying to run each of them as fast as I can, he will have the athletes run them sub-maximally, say three-tenths slower than they're capable of. I'm not 100% sure of the exact slowdown, but uh, but a significant slowdown. And they try to, try to get as close as they can to a slower time rather than going maximally. Uh, I've also done things like this in the past where athletes will do jumps or throws, and rather than as as high or far as possible, try to hit the target, try to jump to the target. Sport is essentially that. Uh, sport isn't, I mean, you play basketball, if every time you jumped, you jumped as high as you possibly could, I'm glad you do that a lot, but let's just maybe say every time you move to the left or right or cut or did a little movement to try to block a pass, these aren't maximal movements, these are all sub-maximal, well, maximal speed, but of sub submaximal magnitude, they're they're precise. <laughs> There's precision. It's not if everything was all out, activate every muscle fiber, you would have zero precision when playing the game, and you'd probably hurt yourself too. Anyway, sorry, try this a little bit of a rabbit hole, but um, there was a good study, and I've referenced this in the last podcast, full length uh, podcast I did that was somewhat on this topic. But Ruzan uh, was the name of the study. I believe it was German, and for those who always ask me about it, it I it was the, the earliest I've heard it mentioned. I've heard Dan John mention it in Easy Strength and Pavel Satsaline, but like um, the sport, the sports science book by Thomas Kurz that came out in the '90s is where the earliest I've heard this. But anyways, it would be two groups of long jumpers. One group went maximally uh, maximal jump every single time uh, in the training. The other group jumped and tried to jump two different targets in the pit, so different targets, different lengths every jump. Um, and at the end of the training, the group that jumped to the different targets ended up jumping further than the group that jumped maximally every time, which is funny because why would that be? You get what you train for, right? If you want to be as fast as possible, train as fast as possible. If you want to lift heavy weights, you need to train with heavy weights and all these things. Um, but there, it's true and it isn't. Uh, it's true because yes, there needs to be that focus, that that nearness, that <laughs> we're in the ballpark, we're in the very very close ballpark of doing these things. But there, the the difference is what I feel like is largely well. There's a couple things. One is what I would call the difference between pure maximal and near maximal, or pure your pure max and a controlled max. And training really lives in this world of controlled maxes. Um, so what's a control max? I mean, I from an objective, uh, quantitative standpoint, uh, that would, like a total max is you're going all out. You're going 10 out of 10, 100 percent. A near max, in my mind, is 90 to 97 percent effort if, in terms of what you would tell yourself for the athlete. Um, and a lot of times you'll actually get faster sprints, uh, jumps maybe, but usually in the sprinting world where things are cycling a little bit quicker and it's cyclical. Uh, you can oftentimes get faster, better results with that mentality rather than 100%. The throws are the same thing. Um, jumps, I'm sure you could get that as well. So that's one thing. As soon as you just start dialing intensity down, even just 5-10%, you tend to get better results. And I find that often is, is because when you get up to 100, there's, there's a very trying hard mentality. And a lot of times that energy of trying as hard as possible tends to get focused somewhere on some body limb or segment. And it usually results in more muscles getting turned on than they should. 
maybe caught in sprinting for the sake of sprinting you're pushing the ground longer than you should more muscle is getting turned on when it should be relaxed and turned off that foot coming back to the front to cycle again there's always going to be compensations or muscles that should not be on many times when an effort is taken from 95 to 100 percent consciously so that's one thing uh, so when you make things a game uh, that changes things as well. Now, I'm not saying that training should always be a game. I, I think that there's a spectrum. I think that many times you should make like a game out of it and some maximal intensities, things like that. Um, you know, I don't think there's that much difference per se. There should be that much difference between training for like basketball or football and skill roots and that fun that comes with that and the fun that comes with training raw athletic skills, sprinting and jumping and, and throwing and we tend to attach so much judgment to those things, and I'll get to that in a bit, but I mean, speed is the obvious one. You're slower than someone else. There's a judgment attached to yourself, and then there's this, there's all those compensations that come into play to catch up. Um, I almost have lost my train of thought here getting on that because I do want to touch on that point, but the gamification of things, making things a game makes learning faster. Synapses form faster. It's good for your brain chemistry. Um, it just makes the process of learning better, and if it's sub-maximal and, and it's still a game, you're going to preserve those technical components. I know in Sam Portland's podcast, he was talking about preserving technical components. They would do technical warm-up drills and then um, do the speed gate golf with those techniques in mind. It still wasn't maximal, so they weren't going to go and start compensating and doing something else. And then you got all the benefits of being a game, um, which again, is just is that's near and dear to my heart, making training fun. Even if it's training those raw skills that just a sprint or a jump or a throw, it's a little bit more raw than training, you know, different skill routes in, in football or, you know, different like, you know, ankle breaking moves in basketball or whatever it is you're, you're doing in your sport. I just, the more we can make that all the same, the better. And uh, my buddy Paul Cater does that type of thing better than um, a lot of people uh, that I have, or, <laughs> I should say, my, my, <clears throat> and my buddy Paul Cater does that down in, my buddy and my buddy Paul Cater down in Alpha Project in Salinas, California, does that really well. It's always it's training with him. Even if you're training, whether it's training, working on cleans or jump, jumping or sprinting or whatever, he always finds a way to make it fun and make a game of it. But the intensity is also really high. And it's like those merging of those two things is just such a beautiful thing. And something I'm always trying to think about and capture in training. So judgment, um, why is making a game of skills and those things, um, or, or like uh, basic strength and conditioning traits, so let's just say sprint, sprint speed, jump height, or track and field traits, you could say too, uh, why is making a game of those things so important? Uh, or, or, or avoiding judgment. Um, avoiding judgment of those things is critical because it's a lot easier to judge ourselves with how strong we are, how fast we are, how high we jump. There's a number attached to it. There's a very like raw... It's very like quantitative. You 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 can't. <clears throat> it's <laughs> it's it's very quantitative. You you can't avoid the numerical aspect of it, and it brings a lot more room in for judging yourself, as well as um. And it's also a lot harder to move the needle in some of these raw sports skills: sprinting, jumping, throwing compared to some other things in sport where there's more precision, there's more skill that can be developed over time, has a little bit less, may have a little bit less to do with your innate gifts in terms of fast twitch genes and muscles and a uh, powerful nervous system that you got from your parents. So, uh, and what I will say this, and, and I've written an article that runs alongside this little talk um, that you'll see, can find on the Just Fly Sports website. But Timothy Galway uh, wrote The Inner Game of Tennis, a tremendous book, must read in my opinion, no matter where you are on the sports spectrum, whether you're just a recreational sport player, weekend warrior, you're a coach of high level athletes or club, you know, club youth, club track athletes, you're a sport parent, doesn't matter, get the book. Um, I'm also not saying that book is the only way to train athletes, there's also its counterpart, Winning Ugly by Brad Gilbert. There are different approaches to kind of the same thing, but I, I resonate with Timothy's approach, it's uh, who I am in my mental makeup, but he gives an example where he is coaching women, um, I think fairly novice women in tennis. It seemed like he worked with a lot of women whose like husbands were businessmen or country club type um, people, and they loved tennis, and the, um, the women were trying to keep up uh, and with the husband and do, and obviously, and they were getting frustrated by the husband would say, oh, well, put your wrist like this and elbow like this and swing the racket like this, and they would get, they would get frustrated. Timothy 
a lot of the examples in his book, he's helping these women to learn to play the game and enjoy the game and have a joy of playing the game. And so he recounts one time where uh, he told them they were doing a running forehand and he's like, okay, just move towards the ball. Just have an awareness of what your feet are doing. If you're shifting your weight into the hit or not, just have an awareness of it. And there's no right, no wrong. Just be aware of what you're doing. Uh, after six balls for, I think, five different um, participants, they all no one had hit the ball into the net once, and the balls had all pretty much gone into the zone on the other side of the court where the, the desired effect was. So they were all good hits, 30, 30 for 30, pretty good hits. After that, Timothy made a comment of, of good job, not there wasn't any ball that hit the net, you know, good work. Um, but even that, even though it's a positive thing, right, like this is positive, it was still um, a judgment in there, or set an expectation like, okay, you didn't hit the net. Well, you better not do it anymore. And obviously, it wasn't what he meant, but that's what was perceived by the group. And then he, he wrote that afterwards, uh, there was eight balls of the 30 hitting the net, and people had a lot harder time. And so any feedback that we give in the coaching space or feedback that we give ourselves uh, we just need to be careful. Or if you're a sport, a sport parent uh, working with a kid, uh, I, I, you know, I have children myself, and just the way that we go about encouraging our children, it's important to encourage them and support them, but I think we just have to be careful in, in setting expectations by what we say. And so regardless of who you coach, the way you form things and the way you set expectations, uh, it, it's a precise act. And I'm not saying that every athlete can never have any sort of expectation. I think that um, pressure, <laughs> especially with elite athletes, is there's an important element to that. But I and, and it all comes down to the individual on the level of the athlete. And so I'll leave it with this, like the pressure, how that all filters into some ways that I think about coaching. And so I'll, like a 30 meter dash is a way, general way that I like to test acceleration ability and then some top end speed if you're a team sport athlete. Um, and I notice a lot of very cerebral athletes Will their first sprint, if I say go, you know, make this fast, I don't necessarily say all out, just do the first sprint fast, um, they'll, they'll run and then maybe we would try again and think about some different things or rhythms or whatever, but and no, ma no matter how many sprints we do, the first one was always the fastest. And it's those athletes are so cerebral and self-judgment oriented, they just can't, the, the judgments and then the compensations that are going to come up in all subsequent sprints where you start thinking about things and all those met that mental machinery is moving will be worse. I found when you turn the second, third, fourth sprints, what have you, into speed get golf, all of a sudden everything gets better. And for example, let's say the athlete ran four, 450 in the 30 meters. And I say, I just want you to run 465 as smooth as you can or follow this rhythm or let's do something you know technical in the sprint. Um, and then you just say, well, I want you to sprint 460, maybe 455. Say, let's, let's just try to sprint 455, make it nice and easy, and they'll go 445. And so that's, I've just found that it, it's not like that for every athlete, but it, there's, there's this, this, um, that's one of the ways that I've taken it. And I think it really adds a dynamic element to individualization. I don't think every single speed session has to be that way by any means. I think I like what like Rob Assis does, uh, of a Homewood Flossmoor High School where like every fourth week, which is typically the D-load, that's where like some of that, um, not, I don't know if he's a speedgate golf per se, but that's where a lot of that like fun stuff, gamified stuff comes in. And I think that stuff is awesome for a D-load week. I think there's a lot of ways to roll with it. But I just think that the gamification of training can be a really good way to get, um, to bring that uh, joy of, of sports skill and, and, and continual improvement in and you get that a lot more hits of that in a speed and jump and throw training session where PRs are hard to come by and so again I don't think everything necessarily should be like that I do understand the need for intensive and focused training but I also love infusing joy and fun into training whenever I can and I think the two can work together so that's my piece for the week again um, you can find the full article for this on justflysports.com and uh, until next time